I'm Tessa Monroe, and welcome to the wrinkle-free world of English Comp. Hey! Over the next couple hours, we got more things in this tape to improve your writing than you can shake a stick at. We got thesis statements, free writing, collecting information, outlines, revising rough drafts, and a ton of other stuff. And we're here to help you write better, but we're also here to help you laugh yourself silly. <laughs> now look in that box the tape came in again. You see those pieces of cardboard? Those are insert cards. Don't be scribbling on them or using them as coasters. There are a couple of essays on them and some other stuff that'll help you follow us without having to sit two inches from the screen. Don't forget you bought a videotape. So you can stop the tape should someone come by with a pizza. Yeah. You can also pause the tape if you want to catch our right-wing subliminal messages. Warning! Have you seen this standard deviance videotape? A.K.A. Stinky. This tape is approximately seven and a half inches in width and four inches in height. Do not attempt to use this videotape as a substitute for attending class. It is armed with information about an English composition class. Citizens who attempt to use this videotape instead of attending their classes and reading their books will be forced to read Chaucer backwards. So go to class! Ahem. Part 1. Writing in college. Fine job, Gord! Indubitably, Grizzle! <laughs> so, why do we write? Well, there are lots of reasons. The basic reason is that writing helps us make sense of our life experiences. It helps us figure out who we are. We think something, we write it down. We write for other reasons as well. Like to remind ourselves of what we have to do that day, to convey a message to someone else, to explain something, or to persuade someone. You might also write to communicate complex ideas and feelings. Like me, you know, I got like, you know, stuff to say and stuff. You'll use writing to do all of these things at some time or other in college. Remember, we're all writers, whether we're writing novels, filling out a job application, or just keeping in touch with a pen pal in Heidelberg, Germany. Hello, America. Hello. But the purpose of this video is to focus on writing in college. And there's more than one way to write in college. In fact, there are lots and lots of ways you'll have to write in college. So that's what we're going to talk about first. Section A. Kinds of writing. Okay, so there's lots of different types of writing in college. But how do you know when to write one way and when to write another? Well, you know by the assignment you're given and the class you're in. You're going to be taking all sorts of classes while you're in college, like anthropology, psychology, chemistry, or business. Now, not only are there different kinds of writing for each discipline or field of study, but lots of times there are different kinds of writing within each discipline. So what kinds of writing are there? Well, stay tuned, because the next thing we're going to look at are the characteristics of a few different disciplines. Like, let's say you're asked to do a lab report in chemistry or biology. You would have to describe the materials, procedures, and results of scientific experiments, then draw conclusions from the results. Or let's say you take a drama class. You might have to do a critical review of a performance in a theater. You'd report the details of the performance and judge its quality in comparison with similar works. If you take a business class, you might have to write a case report in business management. You'd use financial data and other info from real and hypothetical businesses as the basis for recommendations about improving their successes. You may also be asked to summarize professional articles or to argue a position on some controversial issue in many classes you take. But no matter what kind of writing you are asked to do, you will be composing. So is that why it's called composition? Yep, and the types of writing we've just reviewed are just a few of the many kinds of writing you'll have to use during those mind-bending college years. Now, remember when we said that writing is all about making sense of your experience? Yeah. What's your point? Well, that's what you're doing when you're composing a piece of writing. You're making sense of your experience, your thoughts, and your research. It's the same thing every time you tackle a different subject. You're figuring out what you think about the different concepts and issues for a subject based on the things you've thought about, felt, and read, as well as the places you've lived, jobs you've had, and other past life experiences. 
Do I know about past life experiences? The answer is yes. Okay, check this out. Kenya, 1914. I am there in the thick of it in the big field, right? So this water buffalo is coming from behind me and I look at him right in the face and I go, hey, get off me, man. Ho, 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 ho. It was the worst thing that had ever happened to me. Now I'm just me. I'm pretty happy about that, though. Okay, that's enough talk about writing as an abstract concept. Let's leave Planet Abstract now and move on to some of the more specific facets of writing in college. Here's a schedule for the rest of the tape. First, we're going to talk about some general qualities of almost all academic writing. That way we can give you an overview of good writing in college. Then we're going to look at an academic essay written for an English composition class. We'll use this essay to go into even more detail about some of the aspects of writing in college. Section B. Some general characteristics of academic prose. As we've already said, college writing is just one of many types of writing, and there are different kinds of writing for each discipline in college. However, there are some general characteristics common to almost all academic writing. Now where you see these traits and how you see them depends upon the class you're in and the assignment. Coming up next in our program are some general characteristics common to almost all academic writing. First, we'll list the major characteristics of academic writing and then we'll discuss each of them. Johnny, why don't you tell us who sponsored these general characteristics? Brought to you by Extreme Penmanship. When you need it written hard and fast, think Extreme Penmanship with new wide grip ABCU in the stores. Extreme Penmanship says, make your mark. Yeah. First, in most academic writing, you state your main points, then support them through the use of evidence or details. Second, your writing should have an organization that clearly shows the logic of the paper. A third characteristic of academic writing is that it should be fair to other points of view. Fourth, all academic prose should always accurately cite all quoted material and paraphrases for a particular paper. Lastly, your writing should also adhere to standard, edited, American English. <laughs> so let's discuss each of these little buggers. First, we'll look at what it means to state your main points and then support them with evidence. Basically, this means you state your position and back it up. Your position is just how you think and feel about something. It's your opinion. If you don't have a position, then you might as well pack it up and head home. But I am already in Heidelberg. Anyway, essays are probably the most common kind of writing in college. We'll use essays to explain the process of stating your main points and then supporting them. You may or may not have cooked up lots of essays before, so pay attention. This first general characteristic of academic writing is a biggie. In order to explain how you state and back up your position, we'll have to describe the overall structure of a college essay. The beginning of your paper is where you state your position. That's the purpose of an essay and most academic papers. You state a position and then you prove it. Sort of like the opening of a court case. Usually you put your position or the point you're going to make in your paper in the first paragraph. Or it should at least be in the introduction. It certainly shouldn't be on a French baguette. Okay, so now you know to put your position in the beginning of your paper. Now listen up. The first paragraph of your paper, in which you declare your position, is called the thesis statement. The thesis is a really big deal to your college teachers. I mean big. Orson Welles big. Your thesis statement should say the focus of your paper as succinctly and clearly as possible. Your thesis statement tells your reader the main point you're trying to make or your position. But what if I ate my thesis? The rest of your paper attempts to prove that your thesis statement is right. Remember, the thesis statement is the numero uno, mac daddy, primo importante part of your paper. And if your paper doesn't have one, then you're going to be singing the blues. Okay, so your thesis statement is your position on the topic you're writing about, and your thesis is shaped by the class you're in and the assignment. Let's look at another important point to think about as you write and rewrite your thesis. It's also important to have a manageable thesis that's suitable for the length and purpose of the essay. Why? Because you're going to have to prove your thesis. 
Let's say you're writing a five-page paper, but your thesis is about this gargantuan topic that'll take a lot of time to prove. You're going to be in a heap of trouble in the next section of your paper where you have to provide supporting evidence. So after you've stated your position, next comes your supporting evidence. It's sometimes called the body. This is the meat of your essay, or if you're a vegetarian, the hummus of your paper. In this section, you support your thesis and develop your main points. You support your position with evidence, like research or your own ideas. You absolutely should not support it with styrofoam. On behalf of styrofoam users everywhere, I would just like to say that that last statement is a load of malarkey. Styrofoam is perfectly safe in the microwave. Observe. So the body of the paper is where you provide supporting evidence for your position. Supporting evidence might be statistics, quotes, close observations, or anything else that backs up your thesis. It's very important that everything in the body of your paper in some way refer back to your thesis statement. Each itty-bitty piece of evidence and illustration should support your thesis statement. If it doesn't, then lose it. Cut it. Save it for the greeting cards. So you've stated your position and supported it through evidence. So how do you end your paper? The end of your paper is often called the conclusion. The format your ending takes depends upon the length and purpose of the essay, as well as the type of writing you're doing. But finishing up a piece of writing doesn't mean you just restate your position and say you've proved it. The goal of the conclusion is to leave the reader with a fresh perspective on the subject, or even a fresh scent. Mmm, new car. Now, it is important that the ending of your paper leave your reader with a clear understanding of the points you've made. Your goal is to reaffirm your thesis, but also make your reader wish that this wasn't the end of your paper. Man, I wish this wasn't the end of the paper. Wish granted! Your paper shall go on forever! <laughs> so that's a general overview of stating and supporting a position. Remember, we'll go into more detail later in the tape. Now we'll look at the second general characteristic of academic writing. A second important trait in college writing is to pay close attention to the clear organization of the essay. It shouldn't look like a tornado hits your essay. The basic structure of the essay should be logical and clear. In other words, point A should be followed by point B, which is followed by point C. Now, to be sure your organization is clear, you should provide transition sentences between paragraphs that show your movement of thought. Oranges grow in trees. Glue. Citrus prevents scurvy. Let's roll. Need some transition sentences, doesn't it? Transition sentences connect the idea in one paragraph to the idea in the next paragraph. They're kind of like signposts. They help your readers see the direction your thoughts take. Without transition sentences, your readers might get lost and end up someplace like Des Moines. We'll discuss transition sentences some more a little later in the tape. Just remember that no matter what kind of writing you do, it should have an appropriate organizational strategy. In other words, a piece of writing must be organized well so your audience can understand and follow its logical flow. <laughs> now, let's move on to the third general characteristic of college writing. All academic writing should be fair to other points of view. You can't just slam other people's ideas whenever you feel like it. You must say why you disagree and support your own views with evidence or by illustrating the point you're making. A fourth trait of college writing, or any writing for that matter, is that the writer must always acknowledge any sources used. By sources, we just mean other people's ideas or words. Other people's ideas might come from a book, an article, an interview, or the internet. Now, you acknowledge a source by citing it. Citing some information means you're giving credit to who said it or thought it. You're telling your reader that this other person said it or thought it first. There are two ways to cite sources. You cite stuff by using quotations or paraphrases. In a quotation, you take someone else's words and use them exactly as they are in your paper. You must put quotation marks around the quoted words and cite who originally said them. If you don't, then you'll be plagiarizing. Plagiarism is when you try to pass off someone else's ideas or words as your own. 
You don't give proper credit to those who said it or thought of it. Now, even if you read the quote four score and seven years ago, you still need to give credit to the dead guy who said it. Ooh, I'm going to get you for that. You have to cite paraphrases, too. In a paraphrase, you put another writer's words into your own words, but it's still the original author's idea, so you have to credit that author for his or her ideas. So even if you say four score in 2,555 days ago, now I'm really steaming. you still have to cite your sources. So, that's the goods on citing a source. We'll go into more detail on how to use a source a little later. Just remember that the more sources you use to back up your thesis, and the more well-known and respected your source is, the more likely your reader is to listen to your opinions. The last major characteristic of academic writing we'll go over is that it must adhere to standard edited American English. Think about when you're talking to your friends. You often use slang or grammatically incorrect language. But when you write, the rules change. Your writing has to be perfect. That movie was unbearable. So, a good writer's handbook is indispensable. It can help you when you have questions about what kind of punctuation you should use and when to use a certain word. Get one. So that's it for the general characteristics of college writing. Number one, stating and supporting your position. Number two, a clear and logical organization of your writing. Number three, an awareness of other points of view. Number four, accurately citing any sources you use. And number five, your writing must be in standard edited American English. All of these will be explained in more detail later. In the next part, we're going to dive into the process of writing a paper. We'll look at a sample essay for an English composition class. Part ahem. Yes? You said the last part break. I think you're in error. I distinctly remembered that... Oh, well, my mistake. <clears throat> part two, composing the academic essay in the English composition class. And beyond! Now we'll get to the meat of academic writing, or any other type of writing. Sitting down and putting words on paper. So what's the secret to good writing? Well, the bad news is, there isn't one. You can't memorize a bunch of facts or formulas. The good news is, anyone can be a good writer, even Dan Quayle. But the only way to improve as a writer is to write and write and write. It's like playing basketball. You can read books on how to do it, but the only way to improve is to do it yourself. Now, even though there may not be any clear-cut way to write well, there are some methods you can use to improve your writing. The most important thing you can learn is that writing is a process, a series of steps. So what is the writing process? The writing process describes the process you or any writer goes through from the time you begin to think about an assignment until you hand it in to your professor or boss or jilted lover. Now we need to make a quick disclaimer here. We are going to take you through the writing process and the rest of the tape. But the writing process isn't linear. In other words, you don't have to do step one before step two, step three, and so on and so on. It's not like the process of getting dressed in the morning where you'll look like a big goofball if you don't go through the proper steps. She's buttoned your collar. You don't have to compose a piece of writing in the order we're going to. But the process and methods we're going to go through have been proven by college students and writers to be effective. Even though the writing process is not linear, we can say that generally you worry about big things first. I mean, come on, you obviously need to figure out what you're going to say before you can say it. First, we'll look at understanding your assignment. Second, we'll get into free writing or brainstorming ideas for your paper. Next, we'll talk about collecting any information needed to support your position. Fourth, we'll discuss preliminary outlines for your paper, then writing rough drafts, including getting feedback from others and revising what you've written. Last, editing and proofing. Now we need to be clear here. The writing process we're going to go through can be used in any writing situation, whether you're in school or the workplace, but it should absolutely never ever be used to bake a coconut cake because you would get ink in the batter and get violently ill. Yuck. I wish I had some coconut cake. Wish granted! But this cake has ink in it! <laughs>
Next, we're going to take you through the writing process. We're going to go through all the steps from start to finish in the creation of a college paper. First up, your assignment. The essay we'll be using is a sample essay that's typical of one kind of writing you'll be likely to encounter in a first year English composition class. We will be following young Nathan on his journey through the writing process, a journey that will take him into the darkest corners of his mind and one of the most frightening places on this earth, the library. Section A, getting started, defining the task, clarifying the assignment. So you've just gotten your assignment. What's the first thing you need to do to start writing? Fall on your knees and pray for forgiveness? No. First you need to figure out your assignment. Your assignment is going to tell you what to write about and how to write it. That's why it's really important for you to understand your assignment inside and out. Your assignment is like a map of where you can take your paper. And the closer you follow its directions, the better your chance of getting an A on your paper. So ask your teacher if you have any questions. Let's go to Nathan's assignment and see what questions students in his class have. Now if you ever want to look at Nathan's assignment more closely, just look on the insert card labeled Assignment. Nathan's assignment asks him to write a four to six page paper due three weeks from today. His first step is to think back to an environment he's been to, like his home or workplace. Or he can go to a place like a park or library. And he must spend some time observing people at this place or spend time thinking back to what it was like. Now let's go back to Nathan's assignment and look at the second step. The second step is to consider the questions the professor listed. The questions are, how do people act there? And, do some people act differently from others? Then the professor gives an example of a place, a college party. Next, the professor spits out some questions in relation to this hypothetical example. Let's take a look at them. Do freshmen act differently from seniors? Do women act differently from men? Do certain men act differently from others there? So Nathan's going to be observing how different people act in different ways at the place he chooses. Let's check out the third step. It says he must define the social dynamics of this place by describing how people look and act. He'll have to use his own observations and analysis to describe the environment. After Nathan's taken some notes on his observations, he'll analyze why people at this place act the way they do. His professor again goes back to the college party example and lists some hypothetical questions. Like, do freshmen cower in the corner? Are seniors the center of attention? Why or why not? The professor then lists two general questions. Are there social rules that guide this place? Certain things you can or can't do. Looking back at the assignment sheet, we see that Nathan will also be making an argument. He'll be taking a position on this environment. The professor gives a sample argument based on the college party example. Seniors are the most powerful people at a college party because of such and such. And then the writer would describe why he or she thinks that seniors are the most powerful people at a college party. So let me get this straight. You want us to pick a place, watch what happens there, describe how different people act, analyze why people behave in these different ways, and then make an argument based on our descriptions and analysis of this place. Yes! So let's look at the last paragraph where Nathan's professor has summarized the assignment. Nathan's going to be constructing an argument based on his observations about how and or why people interact in this specific setting. He'll support his argument with description and analysis of his environment. Notice he must also support his argument by using three sources. He must draw some conclusions about how and why people behave a particular way in this setting. We'll dance these aspects of the assignment in front of you again, just to make sure you're clear. First, the assignment requires Nathan to use both description and analysis. He's going to be stating his position on the particular setting and backing it up with evidence. His evidence will be his own observations and analysis, as well as some research to back up his personal experience. Let's look at the last part of the assignment. Nathan's teacher has bulleted a list of things his paper must have. A specific thesis statement stating his position, a clearly delineated original argument with observations and supporting evidence, he also has to have a logical organization with transition sentences, 
accurate citation of supporting evidence, and proper use of spelling, punctuation, and grammar. <laughs> but it's not as hard as it sounds. The bulleted list we just told you about matches the general characteristics of academic prose we talked about earlier. And these traits are important, so be sure these characteristics get shipped over to your paper. Let's go over each of these requirements on the assignment sheet. First, a specific thesis statement stating your position. Remember, the thesis statement is the main point you're making in your paper. You state as specifically as possible your position on the topic you're writing about. You support your position, or thesis statement, through your argument. The second bullet point says there must be a clearly delineated original argument with observations and supporting evidence. For Nathan's assignment, his argument will be based on his own observations, as well as some research as supporting evidence. The third bullet on the assignment requires him to have logical organization with transition sentences. So Nathan will have to make sure that his logic is clear and that he uses transition sentences. Remember, transition sentences serve as signposts that guide your reader from one idea to the next. The last two bullets are accurate citations of supporting evidence and proper use of spelling, punctuation, and grammar. Nathan will need to make sure he gives credit to others for their ideas and cites them correctly. He'll also need to use proper spelling, punctuation, and grammar. He can check a writer's handbook to make sure they're done right. That's it for the requirements of the assignment. It would behoove Nathan to check his paper throughout the process of writing it to make sure he's met all this criteria. Remember. It's absolutely vital to your grade and your sanity that you understand your assignment. Next, we're going to look at getting started. So the next thing Nathan's got to do for his assignment is figure out what he's going to write about. Well, I do have some ideas of what to write about, but I mean, uh, I think I know what I want to say, but at this point, I, I don't know how to say it. So I'm a little, a uh, little scared. Probably anyone who writes knows this feeling. You have some ideas, but you don't know how to say them. That blank page or screen can become a monstrously intimidating figure when you're trying to get started writing. But there's a key to getting started. Don't worry about getting it right the first time. Remember, you're not doing brain surgery here. You can always go back and fix your mistakes. The primary reason most people can't get started is that they censor and criticize their writing too much. Let's say you sit down at your desk and you have an idea of what you want to write. But every time you try to write it down, it doesn't come out right. You can't think of the right word to use. You don't know if a comma should go here or there. You're not even sure if you should begin your paper like this. You're thinking about so many things that you finally give up in disgust and attack the nearest person. You can't think of writing that way. Very rarely can you express a complex idea well the very first time you put it down on paper. That's one of the reasons it's so important to think of writing as a process. Things are going to be chaotic at first. But if you keep working at it, your paper will gradually all come together. A good way to get started is to do a free write. Free writing is one of many ways of keeping you on track towards your destination, completion of your paper. To do a free write, you write without stopping for a short period of time, like 10 to 15 minutes. You just sit down with a pen and paper or a computer and write non-stop about whatever you need to write about. The only rule is that you must keep writing constantly without censoring yourself. What if I can't think of anything to write? <laughs> then you write, I can't think of anything to write. When you're doing a free write, you don't need to worry about spelling, punctuation, or grammar. The point of the free writing exercise is to get your thoughts down on paper. Once you've got something written on the page, then you can begin to be more critical of what you've written and worry about your organization and grammar. And don't forget, you can use free writing throughout the writing process. Anytime you need some help getting your ideas on paper, you can do a free write. So let's go back to Nathan's assignment. Remember, he's asked to write about an environment in his past. He first needs to figure out what setting he's going to use. That night, he sits down to do a free write. Here's what it looks like. He starts not knowing what to write. He writes, I can't think of anything to write. Can't think, can't think. Notice. He goes through a number of places he could write about before finally arriving at his high school. He starts with the first place he was born, then goes to the house in the suburbs and the video store. When you're trying to decide what to write about, you want to think about two things. The demands of the assignment, and what about the assignment interests you. Let's go back to Nathan's free write. 
Next, he thinks of a fishing spot, but it would fail to meet the demands of the assignment because it doesn't have much social interaction and because he bets not much research has been done on the social aspects of a fishing hole. He then tries to think of a place he's been to a lot. Notice he thinks, maybe a friend's house or a room at my home, but he decides not to because it sounds boring. So Nathan's selecting his place by what's feasible, given the demands of the assignment and what interests him. Towards the end of the free ride, Nathan thinks of another place he's been to a lot. Uh, yeah, I was uh, just like racking my brain, you know, uh, the video store and the fishing spot and the home I grew up in, and then it just it hit me like a ton of bricks. High school. So at this stage, Nathan's picked high school as his environment. He might change his mind, but that's the direction he's going in. So he's completed the first step of the assignment. He's figured out what he's going to write about. Before we can go into the next steps of the assignment, we'll need to introduce some more terms. Now, as you start to consider the direction of your paper, there are a few things you need to meditate on, regardless of what type of writing you're doing. First, your purpose or objective in writing. Second, your audience or who you're writing to. And third, the format of the paper. These three factors determine what you're going to say and how you're going to say it. The form your thesis statement takes is based on these three factors. What do we mean by this? Well, let's get our hands a little dirty and take a closer look at each of these terms. We'll use Nathan's assignment to help clarify them. Your purpose is why you're writing. You want to ask yourself, what do I plan to accomplish with this paper? You may want to describe an experiment on osmosis you've conducted to argue your position on the origins of the French Revolution, or to research your family history and show people how fascinating or dull or weird or raised by wolves your ancestors were. Nathan's purpose in writing is to make an argument based on his observations of the place he's chosen. Now, if his assignment had asked him to describe a personal experience about this particular environment, then he would use a story structure with descriptive words to show his reader what his place is like. If he'd been asked to do a research paper, then he'd need to spend time researching the history of that place and the people who lived there. In each of these instances, Nathan's methods and format would change because his purpose was different. Closely related to one's purpose in writing is being aware of one's audience. Your audience is whoever will be reading your piece of writing. Your purpose in writing is to manipulate your audience in some way. You might want to persuade them to your opinion. Macaroni and cheese taste better if you use swirls instead of elbows. Or inform them about something. Cheese is made from cows. Or just entertain them. It's important to remember that what you write about and how you write it depends upon who your audience is. Think of a party you've been to lately. Now imagine writing one letter about going to that party to your best friend and one letter as an assignment for a class. You would probably tell your friend what you actually thought about there and what happened. You would probably have some grammatical errors and a conversational tone throughout it. With your teacher, you would probably leave out certain details that happened, and you would have no grammatical errors. The whole letter would be much more formal. So you can see how your audience has a huge effect on what you write and how you write it. Let's go back to Nathan. His audience is his professor. I am so special. How would you like some special tutoring? How can I resist when you're so special? Since his audience is his professor, he'll have to use a certain language and style appropriate to the academic environment. Let's go back to his free write about high school. Notice the slang in several places, like watch lots of movies and lots of stuff there. Also, neither of these is a complete sentence, and Nathan would probably be counted off if he turned in a paper with sentence fragments like these. Now is when it's really important to know your audience. Yes, you are writing for a college professor, but there are many different types of college professors. Your teacher might be a nerd or some stodgy English teacher who hates any use of slang or first person. Other professors see the sole use of academic language as phony. Bring it on! I'm gonna dice you like a tomato, Grandma boy! Ask yourself other questions about your audience. Am I going to be offending them with some of the language I choose? Will they know the terminology I'm using, or should I define it? You see, you just got to know your professor and what he or she is looking for. If your professor is a stickler for grammar, then spend extra time on it. On the other hand, 
If your professor looks really closely at your organization, then be sure to spend more time on that part of your paper. And if you're not sure if you can use first person or slang or whatever, then get up off your couch and go ask your professor. Don't just sit in your dorm room and stew. Just remember that you're writing in order to manipulate your audience in some way. And to do that, you'll need to know your audience well. If you were to offend your audience, you'd just tick them off rather than persuade them to your opinion. So the first two factors are purpose and audience. The third important factor you need to consider is the format of your paper. The format of your paper is shaped by your assignment as well as your purpose and audience. Like a floral designer does for flowers, the format of a paper describes how a paper should look and how it should be arranged. Watch me arrange these flowers. Format includes stuff like the page length, the size of the margins, or the font size your paper should use. I uh, once wrote a paper for a different class in 38-point New Courier uh, font. The paper was five pages long, but um, it only had eight words. Format also includes the style of documentation you should use and other types of materials that might be needed, such as charts or photos. The format of Nathan's assignment is an essay. It doesn't require him to have charts or photos, but he could if he wanted to. He could maybe add a chart of the different groups in high school. Remember, even though your professor will always be your audience, you should look closely at the demands of the assignment. You should spend time throughout the creation of your paper and checking it over at the end to make sure it has the right format. So we've talked briefly about purpose, audience, and format. These are three of the primary factors that will shape your paper. Remember, your purpose in writing is your objective. It's why you're writing or what you're trying to achieve. Audience is whoever will be reading your paper. Format refers to what your writing should look like. All three of these factors influence what you write about and how you write about it. Now, Nathan needs to decide how to mesh his high school environment with his assignment. So he's going to do another free write based on the purpose, audience, and format of the assignment. The best way to do this is to go back to the assignment and circle, underline, and mark up places that refer to the purpose, audience, and format of your assignment. You do this because it would really bite to have written a bunch of stuff only to find out you misunderstood the assignment. I once needed to write a paper on the structure of the American government. I wrote about cement and pillars and uh, wood. It was uh, very embarrassing. We'll start with purpose. A good way to figure out the purpose of your assignment is to look for key words. What are key words? Well, there's please and thank you. Oh, and pardon me. Actually, these are words you can use as a guide for what the professor is looking for in the assignment. Some examples of key words are criticize, prove, and summarize. These key words shape the way you write about your topic. For example, if Nathan was asked to summarize his high school environment, he would write very briefly, about a paragraph or so, the main points about high school. So let's go back to Nathan's assignment where he's marked up his assignment in several places. We'll look at a couple of the keywords he circled, like define. Define means, well, you're defining something. You're setting the boundaries of or giving distinguishing characteristics to whatever's being defined. Nathan's going to be writing about the distinguishing characteristics of different high school groups. He's also circled describe. To describe something means you're giving a detailed account or painting a verbal picture of the thing being described. And let me tell you, that verbal family, they make a pretty picture. So Nathan's going to be painting a verbal picture of the social groups in high school. He'll be using description of these groups to show the reader the different kinds of high school groups. Marking important places on your assignment can clarify your assignment and raise any questions you might have. Nathan circled some keywords to help him figure out his purpose in writing. Now let's look at his second free write. Remember, in his second free write, he's writing about purpose, audience, and format. Nathan begins with his purpose. He has to figure out how and why people interact the way they do in this particular setting. He's beginning to get some ideas and figure out his objective for the paper. 
Let's go back to the assignment. We see he has to describe how people look and act. He also has to analyze why people act the way they do. So let's see how description and analysis materialize in his free write. He remembers there's lots and lots of cliques in high school. The popular kids are beautiful, nerds are smart, some are just socially inept, and others are just plain creepy. He also realizes that most people are in the middle and don't fit into any group. He sees that he's being too general and will need to classify these people into subgroups by their behavior. So at this stage, he's beginning to form a thesis for his paper. He'll look at how these groups are divided and why. His paper is starting to take shape. I am really excited to be doing a paper about high school. Uh, I wasn't exactly a nerd in high school, but uh, I wasn't too popular. I wasn't exactly a jock. And I wasn't too big uh, with the girls. But writing this paper should be an interesting experience. So Nathan has now found a purpose or objective for his paper. He's going to describe and analyze the different groups that form in high school and explore why cliques form. Next, he writes about his audience. His audience is his professor. He thinks his professor is a little strange, but he's going to be able to use some slang to show what groups are like. He's going to have to balance conversation and slang with academic style. His professor also expects him to find some research on his topic. So that's it for audience and purpose. Nathan puts an end to his free write by looking at the format of the assignment. Nathan writes that the format of his paper is an essay, at least four pages double-spaced. He'll have to go into lots of description on different groups to define the social dynamics of high school. He must have a specific thesis with an original argument and clear organization. So he knows the length and structure of the paper. There are a couple of other format issues that the professor listed on the assignment sheet. Nathan must use some supporting evidence and it must be cited accurately. His paper also must use the proper spelling, punctuation, and grammar. So that takes care of Nathan's free write about purpose, audience, and format. So Nathan's done two free writes. His first one was to get him thinking about what he'd like to write for this assignment. He thought about what he's personally interested in and what could work with the assignment. Once he had an idea of what he wanted to do, he did a second free write. In this free write, he thought about how he could make the setting he chose, high school, fit the demands of the assignment. His second free write looked at his purpose, audience, and format for the assignment. He thought about these three factors by marking places on his assignment sheet that related to them. By doing this, he formed a direction for his paper to go in. So you can see how spending just a little time free writing can get you on the right track. Now when Nathan sits down at his desk to start writing, he'll have some ideas to begin with instead of just sitting there staring at a blank piece of paper or screen. Before we actually begin to look at writing a first rough draft, we're briefly going to discuss two more important steps in the writing process. Getting feedback on your preliminary ideas and using journals. Both getting feedback and using journals can make your final paper better. Getting feedback on your plans from the teacher or others can be very useful, since others might catch any potential flaws in your ideas. Uh, so, uh, lavender ink is a bad idea. Yeah. Uh, oh. No, no, that wouldn't be good. Regardless of who you talk to, it's much better to work out potential problems now. And just because you get feedback now, doesn't mean you can't get feedback throughout the writing process. In fact, you should get continual feedback from others as your paper progresses. We're going to talk even more about getting feedback a little later in the tape, once Nathan's written a rough draft. There's a second thing that you can do at this stage of the writing process that'll make your paper better and keep things purring like a kitten throughout the writing of your paper. It can be very helpful to keep a writing or research journal. Many English composition classes will require you to keep a journal. Don't get this confused with a diary. A diary is a book you keep personal thoughts and experiences in. In a writing or research journal, you keep track of your progress and thoughts on a particular assignment or class. Remember, like Lassie and like training wheels, a journal is there to help you. As we said at the beginning of the tape, writing is discovering what you think about your world, the class you're taking, or the assignment you've been given. 
A journal is an effective way to record the discoveries you make. A journal can help you in several ways. For example, as you research your assignment, you can write down your thoughts on a particular article you've just read. This is far more effective than just reading it and underlining, since it helps you get your own ideas down on paper. Journals are also a good place to work out your ideas. Sounds crazy, but a great way to figure out what you want to write is by writing. Journals are a lot like free writing in this way. Journals can make it lots easier on you when you start writing a draft of your paper. You'll have lots of ideas when you actually sit down and start writing. And it only takes a minute to write a paragraph in your journal since you're writing for yourself. So journals are helpful. But if you must write a journal for class, don't wait till the night before it's due to write it. This defeats the purpose. But if you must wait until the last minute, be sure to purchase our tape. The cram-loving world of procrastination, where we teach you how to authentically age notebook paper. So we've looked at some methods to make it easier on you as you begin writing, such as getting feedback from others, like your teacher, friend, or classmate. You can also use free writing and a journal to make it easier for you to get your initial ideas down on paper and to keep track of any thoughts that might go through that brain of yours. Section B. Collecting Information. Most of the writing you'll do in college will require you to collect information of some kind. Now, there's no exact time in the writing process at which you should begin collecting information. The writing of your paper and the researching of your topic go hand in hand, just like peanut butter and chocolate. Now we got a tip for you. As you collect information, you don't want to let your research write your paper for you. You want to incorporate the research into your paper. Don't replace your words with the research. That would be bad. You want to figure out what your own ideas are about your topic and the research. Your paper will be good, and you'll get a better grade. So where do you find research? <laughs> well, it's everywhere! <laughs> but the primary place you'll find research is in your school's library. The library can be a really intimidating place. If you have any questions, there is almost always someone in the library to help you. They're called librarians, so don't hesitate to ask. I was overwhelmed by the library. I, I felt like a tiger in a room full of fine china. Nathan looked like a little lost puppy. My first thought was, was run, Nathan, run like the wind. I massaged his temples like this. She was a lifesaver. It's just a circular movement of the wrist, see? Round and round. There are lots of tools in the library for researching. And now that computers have stormed the library and taken over, it's absolutely essential that you know the basics of computer research to use the library's tools. Next, we'll look at some things you need to consider as you research. First, before you begin researching, you should map out what kind of research you're going to look for. What kind of research you choose depends upon the assignment. Some assignments require a certain number of sources, sometimes sources from particular places. Other assignments might require you to conduct interviews, surveys, or experiments. Regardless of the kind of research your assignments expect you to get, you should plan it out ahead of time. With the increased use of the information superhighway, it's very easy to get lost in a sea of information. So the first thing we'll do is briefly look at some of the sources open to you. The primary types of information are print sources, such as books, scholarly journals, newspapers, and mass magazines, like Time and Newsweek. You can also use computer sources, like internet web pages or email groups. A third type is research you conduct yourself, like interviews, observations, or surveys. Now let's go a little deeper into each of these types of research. You can find print sources in lots of places. Like the library, the bookstore, or the newsstand. As we already said, print sources are stuff that's on paper. <gasps> you may have to look on a computer to get them, but print sources appear in books or magazines first. Now, each college's computer system is set up a little differently. Most have their magazine and journal articles separate from their books. It's really important for you to know your school's computer system. Um, there is another important thing to remember when you're researching, and that is... Uh, don't take your source at face value. What do I mean by that? Well, there are lots of questions that you should ask of the source. Here 
are some questions to ask of your source. What is the date of the article or book? Is it old news based on old methods of research? Is it up to date and aware of current developments in the field? Or does it still use an abacus? You also should question the author and whatever evidence he or she uses. Does the author have an axe to grind or an obvious political agenda? Does the author argue his or her point well? Does he or she use evidence carefully? These types of questions should be asked no matter what field of study you're writing for. So print sources are one kind of research you can use. Another way to dig up information is with the computer, like web pages or email groups. More and more people are using the internet and email as sources of news, information, and ideas for writing. If you use a computer source, then you've got to document it. Check a style handbook to find out how to document computer sources. We could spend an entire tape talking about how to use the internet effectively, so we'll just go over a few general things you should think about when using computer sources. First, computer sources aren't tangible. You can't swat flies with them, and you can't put them on your head and learn to walk properly, like you can with a book or magazine. So, it's a good idea to print out any information you're using and write down the address of the source. You want to ask many of the same questions of computer materials as you do of print sources. Remember, any Joe Schmo can post an email message or create a web page. That means that lots of the information you see on the internet or in email groups is suspect. So be careful. So you want to think about who the source is. Who do they cite as evidence, and is there enough of it? Basically, you just want to question everything the author says. So, we've looked at print and computer sources. Another method of research often overlooked is conducting your own research by doing interviews, making observations, or performing surveys. As with computers, we could spend an entire tape talking about conducting interviews and performing surveys, so we'll save that for the subtly manipulative world of performing surveys and interviews. Section C, Outlining. Okay, you've got some ideas. You know what you want to write about. But you still have questions. What do you do with all these ideas? What should go first in your paper? What should go last? Who invented the donut hole and why? But most importantly, how do all these things you've been thinking, free writing, and researching about connect? At this point, it's kind of like having a bunch of puzzle pieces without the box to look at. You've got all these pieces, but you don't know how to make them fit together. I wish I had a box to look at. <laughs> and if you're confused about where your writing is going, then you're not going to be clear about what you want to say. Unclear. So what should you do? Well, you need to figure out how you can create an essay that has a direction that makes sense and at the same time is detailed and clear. A typical method used to help you figure out the structure and direction you want your paper to take is outlining. There are two primary methods of outlining available to you. One type of outline is clustering. Clustering is a visual grouping of ideas on a page. You group your ideas according to how they connect, not by where they appear in your paper. Clustering is a good way of figuring out how your ideas fit together. So how do you do it? Well, you start with the question your paper asks, or the topic or main idea of your paper. You write this in a circle in the middle of your paper. Next, like free writing, you brainstorm ideas that connect to this central idea. These ideas are branches of your main idea. You keep branching as you think of things that connect until you run out of ideas. Notice it looks like a giant web when you're done. And just for fun, you can add some spiders to your branching. Uh-oh, a fly's caught in the web. Oh, and here comes a big black widow. Oh, no. Clustering is effective because it allows your mind the freedom to connect ideas without trying to force your ideas into a confining structure, like an essay or a rigid outline might. Let's go back to Nathan and use his free write as a basis for his clustering. His preliminary thesis is that he'll describe the different groups that form in high school and argue why those groups form. He can use this as his central idea in clustering. Looking at his free write, we can see that he's already started to divide high school into groups. Nathan thinks the popular kids are beautiful and that there are several categories of nerds. He also thinks there's a group in the middle. 
So Nathan can use these as bubbles shooting out of his central idea in his cluster. These are the major subcategories of his main idea. Next, he splits the nerd group into several social groups. He has those nerds which are socially inept, those that are really into school, and the nerds that are physically unattractive. Remember, cluster outlines work the best when you let your mind wander. I need to change the oil in my car. Oh, oh, and I forgot to buy milk. When an idea pops into your head, you just connect that thought to whatever idea it follows from. Since part of his main idea is to figure out why so many groups form in high school, this can be another bubble coming from this central focus. We'll stop here. You can keep going with your clustering for as long as you have ideas. You can also use clustering throughout the writing process. Clusters can be used instead of free writing. They can also be used to help you study. You can group the main ideas from your class in preparation for a test. Or, when you're given a question on an essay exam, you can organize all the ideas you have into clusters before writing. Now let's look at another type of outline. So are we ever going to start on the rough draft? Remember, all this pre-writing, like the free writes and outlines, are going to keep you from getting writer's block when you sit down to write your essay. These pre-writing activities are kind of like the gallon of gas, jumper cables, and spare tire you keep in your car. If you start to stall in your writing, you can refer back to your pre-writing to get you on the road again to finishing your piece of writing. Now we're going to look at a linear outline. Most of you have probably used this type of outline. You connect ideas and examples by where you think they will appear in your paper. Let's go back to Nathan and see what a linear outline of his paper would look like at this time. His preliminary thesis is at the top. Remember, this was the central idea placed in the middle bubble of his cluster. Now we'll show you how to break one of these social groups into a linear outline. Let's outline the popular kids. Remember, there are several groups of popular kids. The attractive group, the athletic ones, and the smart Alex. These social groups will represent by hyphens. These are subcategories of the larger group, the popular kids. Nathan can go into even further detail for each of these groups. These descriptions are indicated by bullets and are slightly indented from the group of popular kids. Nathan would do this for every high school group. Now there are advantages and disadvantages to each outline method. You should use whichever one works best for you. As we said earlier, clustering allows you to roam freely with your thoughts. You're not constrained by the direction your thoughts take you in. However, this can be a disadvantage at times. Some writers would rather use a linear outline since it gives them a more concrete structure from which they can write. They know where to begin and where they'll end. For other writers, a tight structure can be a disadvantage. Using a linear outline will constrain their thought process and force them to insert ideas where they don't belong. Now, no matter what method you use, these outlines are only intended to give you a direction as you begin writing your first rough draft. As you write, you'll probably find that your outline will need to change. So let's look at where we are in the writing process. We've done a couple of free writes and decided what our topic is going to be and how we can fit it into the demands of the assignment. We've also looked at what kind of research we're going to need for the assignment. We've just finished creating a preliminary outline that has organized our thoughts and given us a direction when we begin writing a rough draft. And that's what we're going to do in the next section. Section D. Doing Rough Drafts. Creating a rough draft is usually the most time-consuming part of writing. You gotta put all those ideas you have into a shape that makes sense. Does it look like a rhombus? No, not at all. Tetrahedron? Hello? Now, when you sit down to start your rough draft, don't worry if your writing still seems a little chaotic. You may find something in that bucket full of chaos that's worth keeping, like the beginning of a train of thought, the opening for your paper, or perhaps even a parfait. That's why it's helpful to do lots of pre-writing. Pre-writing can keep you from having an anxiety attack when you start writing your rough draft and you can't think of anything to write. Nathan uses his free writing and outlining to create a working thesis. And be careful not to create a lazy thesis that'll just sit on your couch and eat your food. On the other hand, working theses are great. 
three working theses can revitalize the economy in six months. A working thesis is just a preliminary thesis. It gives you a main idea to focus on as you begin your paper. It's not set in stone. If you find that your preliminary thesis is not going to work for parts of your paper, then you need to revise it. Here's Nathan's working thesis. In high school, kids separate into different social groups. So he'll have to show how people in high school separate into groups and what groups they separate into. Using this preliminary thesis as a guide for the direction of his paper, Nathan begins writing his paper. And boy, did he write. Now we're going to take a look at Nathan's first draft. At this stage, Nathan's still discovering much of what his paper will be. We'll call the writing you do at this stage exploratory writing. Come on, men. There are verbs to be found and nouns to be plundered. Onward! In exploratory writing, you're still discovering what you want to write about and letting your ideas take you where they may. But this writing is a bit more structured and focused than free writing. So we'll call this first rough draft of Nathan's his exploratory draft. Remember, when you're starting your first draft of a paper, you are organizing your thoughts into an essay, but you shouldn't let this hamper your writing. At this stage of the writing process, it's important to get all of your thoughts down on paper, then go back and probe it for problems later. So let's talk about a few aspects of Nathan's first draft. Notice that most of Nathan's exploratory draft is just an elaboration of his free writes and outlines. Nathan's first draft has profited from all of this pre-writing. His first draft is especially good in two areas, its great amount of detail and its clear organization. Nathan's essay is far along because he has put lots of time into the process. Also notice from his paper that no research has been added to it yet. Now, it varies depending upon the assignment, but it's often a good idea not to put specific quotes or paraphrases into your first draft. Why? Well, your professor's not going to want a paper that's just a bunch of research stuck together. Here is my paper, but I'm afraid it is stuck to my hand. The information Nathan's collected has shaped his first draft, but it hasn't replaced his words. Nathan can go back and add quotes and paraphrases after his first draft where he thinks they're needed. So, you've got a first draft done. Now what? How can you go back to the paper that you're probably already sick of and fix it so you can get an A? Look, don't despair. It's not like you're stranded on an island with only a pen, some paper, and a bag of pork rinds. There are people out there who can help you. That's what we're going to talk about in the next section. Section E, getting feedback toward revision. After you got a draft, then you can meditate on what you've done. You can look around and figure out where you've gone with your writing. Now is the time to be more critical of what you've written. You want to read what you wrote and ask yourself, what in the world was I thinking when I wrote that? We'll call writing at this stage considered writing. Hmm. Considered writing is a bit more purposeful and controlled than either free writing or exploratory writing. You want to use the ideas you came up with in free writing and exploratory writing to begin to bring your paper to maturity and out of that awkward acne stage. You need to think about the assumptions that underlie your writing. Think about how someone else would look at your paper. A good way to do all these things is to get some feedback from a classmate, a teacher, or someone at the writing center of your school. Getting feedback simply means having someone else respond to particular parts of your paper. Feedback? Feedback? I love feedback! What do you think of my eyes? That's a beautiful shade of yellow your head is! Oh, thank you ever so much. You must tell me, how does your head stay so green? I rub broccoli all over it! All day long! Now, many English composition classes require that you get feedback at certain times. They may require you to get some feedback from people in your class or from your teacher, but very few other college courses require you to get feedback on your assignments. It's all up to you to do that. So for the next few minutes, we're going to look at why you should get feedback and how to get good feedback for your papers. Feedback is exactly what you need after you've got a draft in hand. As writers, we need to find out what's going on with our readers as they read our stuff. Remember, we want our readers to think and feel what we want them to, when we want them to. As we said earlier, one of the reasons we write is to manipulate our audience in some way. 
It would help us to hook up little cameras into our readers and see all the thoughts, images, feelings, and impulses that occur as they read our writing. That way we would know if we had them right where we want them. So, some of what you're looking for from your readers is just their initial reactions to your writing, but you also want specific feedback on particular aspects of your writing. So how do you get this kind of feedback? Psychic phone calls? Nope. You get good feedback from others by asking good questions. If you just ask your reader, what do you think of my draft, you're likely to get a response like this. Well, it's, it's pretty good. It's, I mean, it's fine. It's got, you know, stuff words in it. It's, a, it's typed. And you don't want a response like that because it doesn't help you at all. So when you take your paper to someone to read, you need to have a list of questions you have about it prepared. That way, they'll know what to look for when they're reading your paper and can give specific feedback. I wish I had some feedback. Your haircut repulses me. <laughs> Is it really that bad? Now, what kinds of question you ask your reader depends upon the paper, the reader, and what stage of the writing process you're at. Before we look at Nathan's list of questions for his reader, we need to say one more thing about getting feedback. It's important to pick the right person to read your paper. So that cowboy who works at the barbecue house probably isn't your best bet. You want to pick someone who would be a good critic of what you're writing about. It might be really easy for Nathan to pick his parents. But they wouldn't be as thoughtful observers of high school life as someone his own age would be. Since this is just his first draft, he's going to focus on larger issues in his paper. Remember, you work on large matters like your thesis statement, organization, and world peace early in the writing process. You save the smaller stuff like sentence structure, language, grammar, and cleaning out the cat litter box for the end of the writing process. Here are the questions Nathan came up with. Are the ideas I have effectively arranged and expressed? Do I stick to my thesis throughout the paper? Is the paper easy to follow? Are the main ideas developed and supported with proper details? Does my paper fit the intended audience? And does the paper complement my agile mind and manly physique. Nathan takes his paper and his list of questions to Sam in his class. So what do you think of Nathan? Oh, Nathan's a cutie, yeah. Let's look at some of the comments Sam had about Nathan's paper. Remember, the paper she has commented on is paper number one of your insert cards. Changes made to this paper will be in paper number two. Her first comment is about the opening paragraph. Right now the opening reads, groups. They're everywhere. You see them on the street and in people's houses. Separation through grouping manifests itself in countless places, but it seems as though high school is the place where cliques and groups are most common. Sam's marked that the opening could be more specific and interesting, and that the introduction could be spiced up more. She also questions his statement, high school is the place where cliques and groups are most common. She thinks groups outside of high school are just as common as groups in high school. So the opening of Nathan's paper needs some work. Let's talk about openings for a second. You want your opening to do two things. You want your opening to get your reader interested in the subject of your paper and to show the reader the focus of your paper. You use the rest of the opening to develop your focus for the paper and lead into the thesis. There is no exact way to begin a paper. As we said at the beginning of the tape, it depends upon the field of study you're writing for and what the assignment asks. But there are some methods you can use. Um, excuse me, Professor. I'm having a little bit of trouble with my opening. It's kind of dull. And, uh... Come on, kid. Your opening needs to take your reader in. There's lots of ways to do it. Tell them an anecdote. Ask them a question. Give them a direct quotation. A definition. A description. I don't care. Whatever you think works. But you need to wow them. Slam! Bang! They won't know what hit them. First with a right. First with a right. Then a left. Wham! Wham! Okay, uh, wham! Now I'll be going Wham! Now. Wham! Let's look at some of the different kinds of openings you can use. 
The major ones are an anecdote, a question, a direct quotation, a definition, or a description. There are other openings, but we'll focus on these five. Just like a deer hypnotized by headlights, you want your opening to make your reader unable to move until he or she finishes reading your writing. The opening gets your reader interested and lets them know what your paper is about. Now let's look at each of these types of openings a bit. First, the anecdote. An anecdotal opening is a very short story that relates to the topic of your paper. You can captivate your reader and make them want to read more of your writing. For example, Nathan might relate a powerful story about someone who was excluded in high school, leading him or her to some dramatic action. <laughs> oh my God, Terry! You're so... handsome! Using a question is another way to force your reader to get involved in your paper. It's hard not to at least think about a question when it's posed to you, right? Here's a good way to use a question. Ask your readers a question, then don't give them an answer right away. If you dangle that carrot in front of your reader, then you'll make them want to keep reading for an answer. It drives them crazy! Nathan might ask something like, Ever wonder what clique you fit into in high school? Or some other such question. I was a dork. A third type of opening is a direct quotation. A well-chosen direct quotation of someone else's words shows your reader that you've researched your subject well and can make your reader think about your topic in a new way. It'll make your reader want to read on to see what you have to say about that quote. Nathan might pick a quote from a movie about cliques in high school or a psychologist commenting on adolescent behavior. So we've looked at opening with an anecdote, a question, and a direct quotation. Now let's check out opening with a definition. Beginning your paper with a definition can also be effective. Sometimes you may have to begin with a definition because your reader may be unsure of your topic or how you're approaching it. Nathan could start off with a definition of clicks. Now let's look at the last type of opening we're going to cover, opening with a description. Like an anecdote, opening with a description of a place, a person, or an object can pique your reader's imagination. It can take them into your writing and make them want to read on. Nathan could open his paper with a description of what it's like to be walking down the hallways of a high school. It was a dark and stormy night. The hallways of the high school were quiet, but I could smell the remains of the cliques. Regardless of how you begin your paper, just remember that you want your opening to introduce the focus of your paper. And above all, your readers should wish their limbs severed by horses <laughs> rather than not be able to keep reading your paper. Let's go back to Nathan's opening. Nathan's opening does introduce the topic of his paper, high school groups. But unless you're interested in the topic, it gives you no reason to read on. You want your opening to grab your reader's attention. It should be very specific with vivid and engaging language. Have you decided what type of opening you're going to use? Yeah, I think description. Uh, but I'm going to combine description with humor. I think humor, when humorous, uh, can be very funny. When Nathan goes back and revises his paper, here's what he comes up with. This new opening is on paper number two of your insert cards. Why don't you take a sec to read it right now? Groups. They're the cornerstone of social order. From the caste systems of India to the terrifying pecking order in federal prison, separation through grouping manifests itself in countless arenas. Nathan will probably want to continue to refine his opening, but his new revision is more vivid. Instead of saying groups are everywhere, he uses from the caste systems of India to the terrifying pecking order in federal prison. This says basically the same thing as his last opening, but it's more specific and offers two contrasting images in the reader's mind. While I was reading his paper, he was reading mine, but his comments weren't quite as helpful. Let's look at Sam's next comments at the bottom of the first paragraph in paper numero uno. Nathan's last sentence of the first paragraph is, Students in public high school can be broken down into three general groups and into a number of subgroups. Sam is unsure if this is his thesis statement and thinks the sentence is too general. This is around the area where the thesis statement would appear in a paper. Having the thesis statement between the opening and before the supporting paragraphs 
is often a good segue into the rest of your paper. It doesn't have to be here, but it should be placed early in your paper. You see, in academic papers, your readers will expect you to get to the point quickly. This isn't always true in other cultures or other types of writing, but in academic essays, you gotta cut to the chase. Now, let's go back to this last sentence of the first paragraph. Sam thinks Nathan's sentence is too general for a thesis statement. As we said earlier, the thesis should be specific and convincing. It should reflect the aim of the paper. This last sentence does express what he's going to do in his paper. He'll describe the different groups in high school, but he doesn't say what groups he'll break them into, and he doesn't state his position or opinion of high school groups. He needs to make the statement more focused. My paper is going to be dividing high school students into several groups, so I decided to state each of the high school groups in my thesis statement. Well, actually, Sam suggested that. She's very helpful. Oh, thanks, love. We, uh, went to the movies last night. So Nathan needs to make his thesis statement more specific. His paper will be dividing students in high school into several groups. So he decides to state each of the high school groups in his thesis statement. That way, his reader will know that the supporting paragraphs in his paper will describe these different groups. The statement now reads, Students in public high school can be broken down into three general groups. The popular kids, the nerds, and the people in the middle. These groups, once defined, can then be broken down into a number of subgroups. He's now specified what groups high school is made up of. It's more focused now. This is Nathan's new working thesis. We've said it before and we'll say it again. Your thesis statement will probably change a lot as you write and rewrite your paper. Let's go on to the second paragraph in his paper. The second paragraph of his first draft describes the group in the middle. They scoff at the occasional superficiality of the popular people, but still envy them. They feel sympathy for the nerds, but lack the social confidence to befriend them, fearful that they too will be mired in the lowest social group. Sam comments that she likes his description of this group, but thinks it's in the wrong place. Nathan's paper hasn't defined who the nerds or popular kids are yet. His organization doesn't follow in a logical way from point to point. So Nathan decides he'll put this paragraph last after he's already defined the other two groups. But overall, his organization is strong because of his pre-writing. We'll move to the next paragraph of paper number one. The first couple sentences are, the popular kids are the ones at the top of the social food chain. They're lucky. They have all the perks. Sam comments that maybe he could say more about the popular kids. In other words, Nathan could define this group more so his readers know exactly who the popular kids are. Nathan hasn't described the popular kids enough. He thought everyone knew what a popular kid was. This is a good example of how getting feedback can help you see your blind spots. So, Nathan elaborates on his description of the popular kids. He also decides to change the name of the popular kids to the coolies. Nathan's revised paper now reads, the coolies are the group at the top of the social food chain. They're the popular ones. They lead charmed lives. They have all the perks. The coolies can be divided into three basic categories, the jocks, the lookers, and the smart alex. The major change he's made here is that he's listed the three major groups that make up the popular kids. This serves as a signpost to his reader. The reader can expect that in the next few paragraphs, Nathan will describe these three groups that make up the popular kids. Okay, let's go back to the third paragraph of paper number one, where Nathan describes jocks. 